Hey, Anthony, great to see you. How many room to grow jokes are you going to make today? Uh, a doctor once said to me, I had room to grow when I was 17 and I was 5'7 and I'm still 5'7. Actually, I'm probably 5'6. Bye. <laughs> I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Live. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Welcome to the show, Anthony Melcury, right over there. I'm Glenn Houseman. Anthony, so great to see you today. You know, that reminds me when I first started doing the uh, the No Vacancy. Podcast, I want to be like you. I want to be like you. I want to have it look like that. <laughs> when uh, when I first started doing the No Vacancy podcast, uh, you know, five and a half, six years ago, or or so, we started each episode funny little jokes. So that kind of thing reminded me of uh, how I used to do that. I like that. It's a good way to kick things off with a little levity. So what does Anthony and Glenn have in common? What do we have in common? Nothing. Well, That's the joke. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. No, joke we don't have that. I don't think we have anything in common. No, we have a lot in common. We our, both want to be left alone. <laughs> 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 yeah, that is absolutely true. Sup, Daniel? Great to see you. Welcome, everybody, to the show. It's so glad to have you. So today is exciting because uh, we're gonna. I think we're going to really go through what people need to do to get back to sales, get back to making sure that their hotels are running at full steam. And that's why we're going to be bringing on uh, Tammy Gillis today, who's got this great new book out that's uh, right over this shoulder over there. It's always, always got to remember to go the opposite way when it comes here. So we're going to be talking about that. But Anthony, this is so important because we've discussed on our show so many times over this last year, year and a half that a lot of folks out there doing sales right now started in an upswing kind of a market. And they're very accustomed to doing things a particular way that doesn't necessarily involve the sales skill set, right? I'm going to get a lot of people mad at me on this show. Okay. Maybe, maybe Tammy too, but, I, but yeah. I, I have a, I have a point of view. Yeah. Um, I think they're the most important people in the business. And I think um, I have, I have some, some uh, good questions and I look forward to speaking to Tammy about, but can I say something? Because I'm, I, you know, I don't usually talk about this stuff, but I'm really excited about it because I, I really like love person. that you asked permission to ask, uh, ask to say something on your own show, but yeah, yeah go it's, for our it, show. it's our show. It's our show. This morning, I, you know, I was working out and um, I was kind of meditating a little bit, trying to, you know, clear my mind. Mm -hmm. And I decided to go into a plank. Yeah. I meditated for 17 minutes and three seconds what? in a plank. Yep. And I have it on video and I have my, and I have my training partner witnessing that I did 17 minutes and three seconds plank. Oh, that's one for the old man, my friend. Well, I spent 18 minutes eating Oreo cookies last night. <laughs> so very quick, my, my other record was 10 minutes. And you know what that means is I have a plank off with my friend Sarah from Answer Concierge when I'm in California at, at the Alice conference. And I'm not even going to do it because I just don't want to embarrass her that bad. Right now, next week at the Alice conference, we're going to, we've got great surprises. We're going to be doing live shows from over there from the uh, Intercontinental Hotel downtown. So on Monday, we're going to have a great show with a lot of IHG executives, including one, I can't quite say yet, but I'm super excited about it. And on Tuesday, we're going to be focused on LA tourism and Sarah will be there. So it'll be really cool for us to be able to do that plank off. So get, get yeah. ready. Well, if she can do 17 minutes, if she can't, she shouldn't start. Right. All right. right. So right. if you're listening, that's for you. All but, right. yeah, but, 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 but I just want to mention, it's like, listen, everybody's yeah. been through a lot of stuff. I'm going through stuff. Everybody's going through stuff. We're all mm -hmm. challenged. Mm -hmm. It's we, you know, taking time for yourself. It really helps whether it be 20 minutes, 10 minutes, an hour, it really changes your mindset. So um, I'm only sharing that because this morning I went in with my head all clogged up and I came out and I felt, uh, I felt at peace. Good, because I'm doing that this afternoon, Anthony. I got up early. I work from usually seven to two or three straight through without taking a break every day. Today, uh, my kids and, and myself are going to go pick up grandma and go to lunch right after this. So that'll be nice. Oh, nice. Time for myself. I'm trying to focus more on doing the important things because this work stuff, except when we're on air, a lot of the stuff we do, can, you can do it at eight in the morning, eight at night. It doesn't really matter, you know? It doesn't. All right. So one thing that I have trouble with in my business is figuring out sales. I was never a salesperson, Anthony. I kind of came at it in a, in a different sort of direction. So I'm really excited to hear um, today's interview. So let's bring on uh, Tammy Gillis, founder and CEO of Gillis Sales. 
She's been at it for uh, several decades now. I don't want to say how many years is to, uh, to embarrass her completely. But Tammy, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Hey, good morning, guys. So hey, good to see you. And Glenn, just so you know, when you say to somebody, a woman or anyone, I say, know. well, you know what? I don't want to say how many decades to embarrass them. You I have a kid that old. I know. I have embarrassed Several them. decades. Wow. <laughs> I have to update my bio, but you're not wrong, Glenn. I know I'm yeah. not wrong. I, Let's I, just I, say more than 10 years. I, I, I like that. We got to figure out how to all stay absolutely young while having years. Well, of if it makes you feel better, uh, Tammy, it's probably not longer than me. So I hope it would make you feel younger. We have pedigree. I think it's all in the marketing and the positioning. So we have impressive right. pedigree. You know, we, we have we have that, but we also have bullshit meters after uh, <laughs> this business. Uh -oh. and, the, okay. and the bullshit meter just kind of, you know, just gets rid of a lot of nonsense so we can get to the, we can get to it. So but, like it's, I got your book this morning because it was apparently embargoed from uh, from Canada uh, and it took a couple of days to get here. So I've read like seven, eight pages. Right. Uh, but I'm going to read the whole thing today because I think it's, it's I think it's really gets to the heart of where we were pre pandemic, uh, where we're going now in jail. So, so tell me, why'd you write the book and tell a little bit about uh, who you are and, um, and first of all, I love the color. It's my favorite color. Oh, thank you. Yeah, our publishing company did a great job. So why did I write the book? Well, to Glenn's point, I've been at this a long time. I started uh, with Hilton 28 years ago, and that's how I, I cut my teeth. And I became one of those accidental salespeople that I talk about in the book. Because very few people grow up saying, I want to be in sales. And I kind of fell into sales and was fortunate enough 28 years later to make a career of it. What I've noticed along the way, and this answers your next question about the purpose for the book, right. is we've been doing it wrong for a very long time. I know that's a general statement. The way we onboard salespeople, the way we train them or the lack okay. of training there are a lot of things. Um, and so my my motivation to even starting my own company was so that we could elevate the sales profession, do it better, show up in a different way, and really encourage people, more people, to get into this profession because it is the lifeblood of hotels, right? What is, I would like to do, have you ever done anything or seen anything where when uh, people read the word sales, right? Sales manager, sales yes. person. What's their impression of the word salesperson? I love that question. And when I'm in class doing a training session, because we've all been sold to, right? How many sales emails every do day. each of you get every day? And so there has been a lot of studies. Daniel Pink talks about it in his book, many books, and it's slimy, um, used car salesperson, manipulative. Right. So there are all of these negative associations and none of us want to be hustled, right? So when we've been on the receiving end of a bad sales experience, right. what happens when we become that salesperson? We don't want to look and sound like every bad salesperson that tried to hustle us. So I think it has a very negative association. And to be honest, in some cases, we've earned it. We've earned it and we need to elevate it and realize that what we're selling is not what the customer is buying. And that is probably the, our biggest mistake. Yeah, it's very rare that you get a good salesperson. A good salesperson, from my perspective, is you just talk to me about whatever we're talking about. Like, it may not even be about the car you're trying to sell me. Could be about the weather. Could be about just, like, I'm on a shirt I'm wearing or whatever. Just develop a relationship. I just walked into a car dealership uh, looking for a car. My daughter graduated, promised her a car, and I want to get her a safe car. But I said, you know what? Let me look at the Subaru because my friend Glenn has a Subaru. So I walked into the dealer, and first of all, the woman sucked her teeth like I owe them money. And finally, I said, can I get a salesperson? A salesperson came up. He was dressed like he was going – I don't know, kayaking, ice climbing, swimming, and surfing. Like his outfit was ridiculous. And he comes over to me and he's like, hey, what's up? And I came in, we're looking for a car. He goes, what are you looking for? I go, I don't know. He goes, all right, well, what kind of car? I was like, I don't know. I was like, I want a safe car for my daughter. I said, like, I don't really want to pay a lot of money. I just want a safe car that's you know affordable. And he's like, all right, come to the basement. So we go wow. to the basement. I go, yeah, yeah, that's not, I don't really like that car. Oh, that car's nice. How much? He goes, 
whatever it was. I go, yeah, that's a little bit out of my price range. I don't really want to spend that much money for the car. Um, you know, thank you. And I turn to my wife and I go, keep walking. So we keep walking. I walked right out of the showroom. <laughs> He well, probably yeah. didn't ask you a single qualifying question. I walked out of the showroom. I said to my wife, just keep walking. He'll stop us. We're in the car. I go, he's going to come out. <laughs> We're on the highway. I said, maybe he's chasing us. He's actually sitting outside the house right now. Just He look. literally let me walk out like with no problem. Wow. That's why it has a bad reputation. It really does. And we've been doing it wrong. At, and to Glenn, to your point at the kickoff is we had 10 years of really great right. – uh, RevPAR growth. And so the sales muscles that were required over that 10 year period are very different than the sales muscles we need to flex to get at to get out of this and to get into recovery. But most people aren't trained. And it's not just the new folks. Even, you know, I talk to folks who've been doing this 20, 25 years. And there's a shift in mindset as much as a uh, uh, leveling up of skill set. But, right. but a you, lot of work. Would you think I just had an epiphany. Do you think the word sales, if we change the word sales, because if you look at TikTok, right, you can change TikTok to sales. You can change it to sales platform because everybody's selling everything, right? Everybody's selling their brand. They're selling, you know, they're, they're selling everything. So, so they don't say sales. Nobody on TikTok or Instagram or no one's selling anything. They're selling mm -hmm. everything and they're selling nothing. Um, Charlie, this girl is on TikTok. She's got 600,000 million. Uh, she's the biggest thing right now. They're saying she's going to, she's going to surpass the Kardashian soon. Uh, one of the major, um, um, uh, brands, where, where's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, agents, agencies, yeah. one of the major talent agencies, the president of the talent agency just left to become her agent. He was the CEO of a major talent agency. To be, so she's making hundreds of millions of dollars a year on TikTok. She's not selling anything. She doesn't talk about selling anything. So I think the word sales is mm. something we really need to focus on because I hate that word. I hate the word. I hate being sold. I hate salespeople. I don't want to hear <laughs> the word sales. If you tell me, I hate the word influencer, but maybe we have to reinvent the word, Tammy. Relationship <laughs> management? Well, it could be business advisor. So, so here's the thing. Well, business advisor better than sales. Yeah. It should never be forced, right? So so if salespeople get attached to an end result, like I need to have a sale and hear the cash register ring at the end of it, sometimes it's not a fit. Not every customer we talk to is a fit. It's not about getting everybody to love your brand and to buy what you have to sell. It's about asking the right questions and if it is a fit finding more of those clients who value what you have it's not a hard sell so maybe it's business advisor because we should never be forcing the sale on someone who doesn't value what we do and what we have i gotta get in here and ask a, a question about this sort of thing um but when you have a sales job if you're not properly equipped to do the job in the second half of 2021 you're going to be really focused on having to hit your job requirements. You have to do X amount of dollars or sell per year or whatever it is. So it might steer you down the wrong path to go do some more strong arm methods that we were kind of talking about earlier or not really focus on creating relationships now for that sale in two or three really good four years from now. Yeah. So here's the challenge for a lot of us that were, and I say this respectfully, that were really in a fortunate position to be more order takers over the past 10 years. I that a lot. We have to take a step back. And first of all, whether you're uh, a mid-scale, upper-scale property or a full-service hotel, not all the market segments are coming back. So there's an opportunity for owners, operators with their sales teams to be able to say, what are the segments traveling now? cast a net in their backyard and say, what are the segments that are traveling right now that fit in with our rate strategy, our product offering, our location? Are you in a tier one secondary tertiary market? And I think we also need to look at who we're competing with. Yeah, but I and think the question, if I can if I can interrupt, I think the question, uh, Glenn, because I think it's a really good question is, when people are basically incentivized based on sales goals, and like you make three cents, but then if you hit these sales goals, you make a billion dollars. Is that your question that, that, that becomes about the goal and not the relationship? Is that your question? Uh, yeah. 
I said that that might be a reaction by the sales professional who hasn't been properly trained and doesn't right. understand all of the methodology. Right. They focus on the results that they have to get as opposed to understanding the process fully, which yes. will get them to that result more organically and more kindly. So how do you take, like, I don't, like, personally, I am allergic to incentives. I've always said, this is what I get paid. I will then, you know, do what I want, need to do. And then if you like what I'm doing, you're going to write me a big check. Okay. That's, or I'm going to walk because I'm confident right. in what I do. Um, I literally shut down when I'm incentivized. Because now I'm nervous. Now I'm nervous. I'm going to hit them up because I know that I'm going to do it, but I may not do it tomorrow. I may not do it the next day. It may be relationships. It's going to take me a while. Mm -hmm. You you and I are working together, Tammy. And I said, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I said, don't incentivize that. Let, let's, let's come up with a deal, but don't incentivize me because if you do, I'm not going to do anything because I'm going to be, I'm going to be paralyzed. You and in the last week, in the last week, everything I said that I'm going to connect you to, I did. Just because I did it in my pace when I felt like doing it on my timetable because I'm a busy guy and I did it. So so to me, I think for me personally and a lot of people, incentives are not the way to go. So do you see like when you're training, is it better just to pay people what they're worth? And then at the end of the year as a team collectively, if we perform, we get bonus out? Or do you find pay a little bit up front and incentivize everybody every quarter. What do you, what's the best metric? Yeah, that's a million dollar question that I think a lot of companies try to figure out. So here's my take. We have a sales organization of 30 plus folks, right, at our company. And we we hire hunters. So I guess I'll answer this this way. Are you looking for hunters or are you looking for farmers? And most hotels need both. Right now they don't have the luxury of both. If right. you want a farmer who's managing incoming inquiries, all the wedding bookings, doing catering, managing relationships, they're not going to be driven necessarily by a quarterly incentive. But if you want, and you can, through your interviewing, find out if they're a hunter or a farmer, most hunters are highly competitive. Right. And if you ask, if you need a hunter, do not hire a farmer and vice versa. So if you want a hunter to go out there and find new business and steal and somebody who again, um, takes pride in performance and wants that carrot, for us, it works. We pay out a quarterly incentive. We just yesterday had a call and our, our leadership team walked me through Q2, which we had a phenomenal quarter, not Gillis sales. I'm not saying Gillis, uh, you know, bragging about our results, but the results for the clients in our hotel program. So we're going to be writing a big check this quarter because, and they, they love it. If we didn't have an incentive, um, so I think they'd become complacent, quite candidly. But, but that's the key, right? Because I, my guy who sells me my Volvos, he's a lunatic. He's the number one sales, uh, a Volvo salesman in the world. Okay. He's in Huntington, Volvo. If you ever want a good guy, his name is Joe Vitale. Great guy. He deadlifts or back squats 1,100 pounds. Well, he did. Now he's like 63, but he still back squats like five, 600 pounds. He's hyper, hyper, hyper hyper competitive. He drives Harleys. He's built like Arnold Schwarzenegger's and he's a great guy. But when, when I have to get paperwork done and I've been really busy the last couple of weeks, I didn't get any paperwork done. Guess what? He did it all for me. I was mm -hmm. just like, I can't do it. I can't do it. And he did it all for me. And before I knew it, there was a, there's a, a car waiting for me and everything's done. License is done. Registration's done. I didn't do one. I didn't do one thing because like he's that. that guy. He's a hunter. He's going to close it. He wants to show everybody every quarter he's the best salesman in the world so it leads me to my next question how do you identify get rid of the people like me like you're going to get me to manage your sales people or manage your company yes. yeah. you're never going to get me to sell a damn thing because i will suck at it but 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 so how do you see me coming in and say yeah I, i'm a young guy and i want to be a salesperson and i'm going to sell for you because i just i need a job and i want to do it but how do you identify that anthony yeah, you, you kind of talk a lot and you seem like a good salesperson, but you just don't have the skill level to sell. You're not a you're not a hunter. You're a farmer because I yeah. really am a farmer. I love that. But but so how do you identify that? What are your and again, I hate to use them tricks or secrets, but what are your what's been your experience of how do you identify an, a guy like me 
who seems like he's, you know, could be a great salesperson, but you know, because you've been doing this for a while, according to Glenn, that, uh, <laughs> that, 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 you know what, Anthony, you don't belong in sales. Like how did, what do you do to identify those people? Cause I think people listening to the show right now, that's their biggest problem. And right now we all need warm we need bodies, hunters. right? We need warm bodies. So people just put people in their, in their job because they look good or they smell good and they sound good. So what's the secret? Yeah, so there are a couple of chapters in the book towards the end of the book. And the one is knowing what good looks like. And so what this means, because a lot of general managers and owners have been very frustrated over the years, even pre-COVID, because they have such high sales turnover in their sales department. Part of the challenge is they don't know what good looks like. Owners so and GMs. Read, let, me read, let me read the first. I haven't read this yet. Knowing what good looks like, hiring, onboarding, retaining sales staff. Hotels have an incredible opportunity to hit the reset button. Okay. Consider for a moment a salesperson or sales director doing sales for the last 10 years in the hospitality industry. What may they tell you about their experience? What would they tell us about our, their experience? They were busy. They yeah. were they were traveling. They were filling out a lot of RFPs and proposals. They were shaking hands, kissing babies, going to a lot of trade shows. And listen, it's not to say they didn't hustle because in a lot of secondary markets, we saw a ton of development in select service hotels in that segment. So those GMs all of a sudden had to get salespeople or hire companies like ours because they had to compete for the first time. Right. But the challenge is owners and GMs think that all salespeople are the same. They don't know what good looks like. So, hey, you're a director of sales. You've been in the business for 10 years you know what to do. That's not the case. So in the book, I actually dedicate a section to having pages of interview questions. Mm -hmm. So these are interview questions. When we're hiring an area sales manager, we do not hire farmers. All, you know, our hotels are hiring us to hunt for new business. Mm -hmm. This is qualitative. It's not quantitative, but there's different categories of questions. So here's one of the dead giveaways when we're interviewing sales folks. And I've, by the way, we've been hiring ongoing since December and we've interviewed hundreds of potential salespeople. Mm -hmm. And one of the first questions is what's your favorite part of the sales process? What is your least favorite part of the sales process? And if we hear, Oh my gosh, I love relationships. Hold on, I love hold on. Can I can answer that question? Let me let you answer that question. Let me answer it the way I would answer it, and then tell me what you're then explain what 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 I said is wrong or right. I so, love it. Glenn, uh, I told you this was improv, right? This was gonna be an hour of improv. Uh, I love I it. Oh, it's just uh, Anthony needs to be doing a little bit more of the yes and I think. I love it. Okay. <laughs> What, is, so, I, I, what am I doing wrong, Glenn? Oh, nothing. Nothing. I'm just teasing you. Go ahead. So, Anthony, Very thank you for applying for area sales manager. I see you've got this great experience from, you know, the home two suites in, you know, Wichita. Tell me, what is your favorite part of the sales process when you look I love at being the sales able, process? I'm going to be honest with you. I love hitting my goals. I love being able to destroy the entire sales department and be the number one performer. And I just love being able to um, just, I'm, I'm an A type personality and I'm an overachiever. So whatever goal you give me, I'm going to destroy it. And I'm going to try to be the number one salesperson every single day. And that I want to be director of sales for Hilton one day. And that's what I want to do. I'm not, you know, that's my goal. My goal is to be the best salesperson in the hotel business. And so how would your director of sales rate you oh. relative to your peers in terms of performance and achieving and, and level of competitiveness? Where would you rate? I don't have to be managed. Um, just leave me alone. I will do my job. I will hit my goals. And um, if my manager manages me, they'll probably fire me within 90 days. If they leave me alone, they'll promote me in 90 days. So what's your least favorite part of the sales process? Being managed. So of the process itself, from the hunting to the qualifying to the closing to the relationships. The relationship. Getting relationship and that person knows that when I say I'm going to do something for them, I'm going to do it. So if I say they're going to get 30 rooms, they're all going to be next to each other on the third floor and Sally's going to check them in. Sally's checking them in. They're going to have 30 rooms and they're all going to be next door and I'm going to clean all their rooms. And if I tell them that, it's going to happen. 
Okay. So what Anthony revealed, and we would dig a lot deeper, Right. when someone tells you type A personality, they crush goals, they love to meet numbers, he's showing signs of a hunter. Right. If it's about the relationship, the nurturing, and here's another thing. Right. Some, that makes some, sense. Because the, other, the nurturing and all of that leads more towards cultivating, which is a farmer. And you need to be a little bit of both, okay? You need to be a little bit of both. But when a hotel, so here's the thing, hotels have an opportunity, they furloughed their sales teams and they have to say, who do I bring back and when? So there's a couple things going on. If they bring back the same person in the same seat that was order taking, they're gonna have a hard time going after business. If you're also a big box seller that is experienced in a single market segment, you are going to have a difficult time. Right. Multi-segment sellers are going to be highly sought after. And what a hotel needs now is going to be different than what they need in six months when all these segments start coming back. But so that person that just spoke to you, like I would have been a little less aggressive and I would, but I would have said the same thing in a more professional way. Would there be an opportunity for me to work for you? Or you think I would just be a problem child? Well, you would have to go through three interviews and there would have been a lot more questions. And we also do kind of a, a personality profiling. But your first answer, I liked. Oh, about, you did? Oh, I thought I, it would turn you off. Uh, so uh, We need I, someone competitive that's an A-type personality that wants to crush goals. That's what our hotels pay us to do. Yeah, Tammy, we got a great question here from uh, the, uh, Jeannie Shannon. Can you be a hunter in one environment and a farmer in another? It's about matching the skill with the right environment is key also, she says. And let me take that a step further. How does that play into what you're talking about right now? I think you can be a, a bit of both. And it's a really great question because I'm, I'm, a, I'm both. I'm smack dab in the middle. And I think you have to be able to flex whatever muscles required. Right. So you need to, you know, for for those GMs and, and um, you know, directors of sales that are bringing their team back, can that farmer flex? Do right. they have the experience? Do they know how to be scrappy? Do they know how to go after segments they've never had to go after before? Right. I mean, we're all looking for these buying signals right now and following the breadcrumbs. The phone isn't ringing. So what are we doing? Um, and are we being curious enough to go out there and... And can we pick up the phone and make 20 cold calls a day and hear no 19 times or get 19 voicemail messages? That is not for everybody. Right. And it, it's it's a lot harder than that right now because you may not have done that over the last X amount of years that you've been in the workplace. So you have to now relearn all of these skill sets. And I think that we had such great times up until March of 2020 that it may have covered up a lot of our professional um, inconsistencies there, right? So now people are dealing with not only much more adverse sales environment, but some of the areas that they need to work on in their personal and professional skill sets may all of a sudden becoming uh, a, a light might be shined on them a lot more. So how can you get people to understand that they need they need to grow because they have room to grow, obviously, and to understand that they thought they were doing it the right way. Now's the time to be open and honest with themselves about where they are, how they can improve and how they could better match the sales environment of 21, 22 and beyond. Yeah. Look, when you look at how we onboard salespeople, we train them ad nauseum to be subject matter experts on their product. And that was, you know, 30 years ago when I started you're given a sales kit, a site inspection. The GM takes you to lunch in the restaurant. You, you know, you do a SWOT analysis. You look at your comp set. We are not training people to be experts on the business. So, you, so back 30, you know, 30 years ago, even 25 years ago, right. you have to be personable, be a great talker, know your product. Now we need to know revenue management. We need to have business acumen. Right. We need to be great um, presenters. We need to understand analytics and data. We need to know how to do research. So this the skill set and the characteristics of salespeople have changed, but our onboarding of salespeople has not evolved. We right. give them a desk, give them a territory, give them a goal, and 
if GMs don't know enough to be dangerous, right. how are they managing them? Uh, yeah. They're pushing them in a corner and at the end of the month saying, you know, why am I not seeing results? They're not being supported the way they need to be supported. Right. And the interesting thing is um, by, you know, there's that, that expression that doing uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again with the, the same exact results. And I think hotel salespeople and those that manage them at the executive level, they might have that same kind of problem that's out there. Do you think that's an accurate observation? They do have that same same problem. And, you know, I posted about this on LinkedIn yesterday. Skill uh, Sales is a skilled trade, and we don't treat it like a skilled trade. And it often takes a back seat to operations, and it needs to have an equal seat at the table. When you look at the business acumen that an owner, an operator needs to have, that an accountant or a chef needs to have, you know, all of that is optional in sales. And it's both art and science. It's not just about smiling and dialing. You have to manage a CRM. You have to be able to manage all those prospects properly, whether it's Delphi or Salesforce. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to know that it could take 12 points of interaction before you get the business. Right. How do you manage and dialing. I love that. Smiling and dialing. There's a lot of smiling and dialing. And how there's so many salespeople who don't even use a CRM. So guess what happens to all those furloughed salespeople last year? They took all that knowledge away with them. And that hotel is starting from scratch. Wow. All those relationships they built. And I'm not doing a plug for a CRM. I'm not. Okay. I'm not yeah. But we listen, we use Salesforce as our CRM. And, and we have a, a, a saying in the company, if it's not in Salesforce, it didn't happen. Because you cannot properly manage your sales pipeline if you don't right. have if you don't have the proper um, traces. Salespeople hate admin and they're not trained properly and a GM for the most part is gonna say, I'm not spending money on all those sales tools. But you, you know, you said something that I think is really critical and you said it kind of in passing, but I think it's really critical because I learned this at the Plaza Hotel with Tom Civitano. Tom Civitano is a legend in our industry in New York, director of marketing and sales. And he had a seat at the table. When he sat in our weekly meetings, he sat at one side and our general manager sat at the other side. And it was the days of Home Alone 2 when they were filming there. He got that to come. And it was like it was like the heyday of the plaza. It was like everybody was filming there. Everybody was staying there. And when Tom was in the room and the general manager was a really, really, probably the most challenging person I've ever worked for in my life, like Tom took half the power away from him. And he... Did, I remember one argument, and I won't go into it, but he was like, that's not happening. And and I remember going, you just said that to the general manager? And he's like, we'll talk about this offline. And I was just like, whoa. And so when you say a seat at the table, you're right. That person that's running the sales effort, it's really before revenue management became really, as, as we thought, as important as it is today. But I remember... So I think it's really important that you said that. Like a director of sales, even if you're in a limited service hotel and you're a director of sales with one person, if you're not able to be able to square up on the general manager, and that doesn't mean be disrespectful, but stand your ground and fight for your department, that's a problem. And, and that's not only in sales, it's in a lot of departments, but specifically in sales because – you know, one of our hotels, we had the, the director of sales win employee of the year one year because mm -hmm. I made, I said, your number one job is to sell housekeepers. If the housekeepers and front desk people love you, okay, they will support you when you go sell something. They'll make sure the VIP is VIP. They'll make sure the rooms are spotless the way you want them. They'll make sure the flowers are delivered. Mm -hmm. she, right. won, she won employee of the year. Laura, Laura Boyardi was her name. And she won employee of the year that year. I'll never forget that because usually – the, the people running the operation think she's out, you know, traveling and having great dinners and she has a, a cushy job and she makes a lot of money. What they don't know is when she sells something with her mouth, their butt better be able to sign the check. And if you don't get that relationship close, and I don't think a lot of people do a good job doing that. You know, that it's a really great point. And I, I remember my first director of sales role, I was 28 and we had this general manager that most people were terrified of. And I was this bold DOS. Um, he trusted me and I had an equal seat at the table. 
And I gave him visibility and I was part of the commercial, what we call now that commercial strategy. So we sat down with, we didn't have revenue management back then. So, you know, our, our controller and our GM and our front desk manager and our director of catering, we all developed the commercial strategy. It wasn't done in a silo. And then from that commercial strategy, that then gave me the plan to go take back to my team to execute uh, right. you know, segment by segment. And people couldn't believe that every quarter I kept getting more budget for sales. Uh, you know, like, what is it? Why, why can you get this GM? Um, he gave me an, you know, a seat at the table and I gave him visibility. I took him on sales calls. I wasn't afraid to take my GM on sales calls. He got to see how hard it was to close the sale. And then he went back and hold our operations team accountable to keep the business. Ah, he trusted me. That's so incredibly important. It's so yeah. incredibly important. It was an amazing lesson. And, I'll, and one of the, the greatest rewards, I remember we sat at the table and we were coming up against a tough budget period. And our director of housekeeping and our director of front office said, I'm giving up my budget so Tammy doesn't have to cut marketing dollars because what that team is doing is working and I'm giving up some of my budget because she's bringing in business. I mean, that's an ideal environment. Um, but it's, but again, it's about hiring, right? Because that person that they hired at the front office is a, and I hate the word team player, but he's, he's a smart player. He understands it's not, ego, he's not ego invested. He's team invested. And we all have big egos, right? But when we're, we're whoever has the best idea wins. And so he's like, you know what? What she's doing is working because he felt important. You somehow made him feel important. Whatever you did, whether it be asking his questions, answering right. questions, whether it be in involving him in the sales process, appreciating and respecting his team is the reason he did that. And I wasn't territorial. It's not my hotel. It's not my team. This is this is the hotel. We had 30,000 square feet of meeting space, 300 and some rooms. This, it took a village. And uh, when you kind of approach it without ego, you ask for what you need to be successful. You don't always get what you want. But I think the challenge is the director of sales or that salesperson isn't brought in at the planning stages with revenue management, with that owner to help develop the sales plan. But right. there's... There's still so many hotels operating without sales. It's crazy. That is crazy. But I want to flip this around uh, in just a second. But first, I want to say, hey, if you're interested in getting the book uh, Room to Grow, of course, it's available uh, at Amazon and, of course, Amazon.ca for Canada because that's where Tammy's from, Barnes & Noble, and many other places as well. But, Tammy, what I'm curious to ask you is sales needs to evolve. Because the people buying the room product have changed. Yes. What do those people want right now? What's important to them? How could you better understand their needs in order to build that relationship and get the, the yes when you put that proposal out there? You ask good questions. Right. <laughs> you must have been a journalist, right? Or something in another one life. One day. One day. <laughs> So we got away with a lot when times were good. The modern buyer has evolved because of technology and they do not need salespeople for rates, dates, and space. You're going to hear me say that a lot. I reference this a lot in the book. And we have salespeople in this day and age still right. selling rates, dates, and space. They right. can go on any website and get that information. So it's an insult. But right. back before COVID, we got away with those transactional conversations because the demand was there. So when the phone's not ringing and there's no demand, you are going to blend into the noise and be the easiest right. salesperson to, um, to get off the phone or to not return or ignore their email. And so when I mentioned at the top of the, the hour, you have to figure out what you're selling because what you're selling isn't what the customer's buying. So if you're talking to a general contractor, right. what they care about is very different than a swim coach planning a tournament for their team or a procurement manager you're negotiating uh, a global hotel program for. But we are taking, you know, I say this term a lot, yes. uh, we're, we're pitch slapping our clients all day long with a P. <laughs> we're pitch slapping our clients. Please, please. <laughs> we're selling great states and space. And this isn't just new folks. This is like, you know, I train people who've been doing this 20, 25 years and we're still so excited. But guess what? 
What do all hotels have in common? Uh, they have beds and they have toilets. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Rates, dates, and space. So why would that be your lead horse? Why is that what we're leading with? Instead of, hey, general contractor, I know that your crew members work 14 hours a day. They value being able to get breakfast, a hot breakfast before they leave the hotel at 5.30 in the morning. And that well-lit truck parking is critical. So their truck's not broken into in the middle of the night. And they want to come back and grab a beer at the bar. And they want flexible housekeeping. That's a very different value proposition than what you're going to tell a corporate buyer from Amazon. And that's not how we're treating customers. And I can tell you if there's an, an amazing uh, study that I reference in the book by CSO Insights in 2018, they surveyed thousands of buyers and they also interviewed thousands of sellers. You know, on a scale of one to 10, how do you think we're showing up? We think we're showing up pretty well. We think right. we're valid, but there is a lot of data that shows that clients say we're not. I'm getting no value. In fact, I'm bringing salespeople in later into the buying process because I really don't enjoy working with them, and they're not adding any value. Right. Well, this makes a, this makes a whole lot of sense to me because uh, the analogy to is I see the same exact thing when people come to pitch me to have people on this show. A lot of times they don't spend any moments whatsoever, literally zero time trying to understand what we do here at No Vacancy Live. And then they send me a query that is totally off base that makes it look like they don't know what they're doing. So I'm never going to work with that person. So when it comes to selling your hotel, if you're not researching who you're going after and then getting on there and say, and being honest, I may not know everything, yes. but I know this, let's have an open dialogue, how I could meet your needs. Then I think you're doing yourself a disservice and hurting yourself more than helping yourself. It's not even a neutral thing. You're just, you're damaging your ability to close business. Anthony. It, it, I get a hundred inquiries a week from all my sources of media and I am telling you maybe one out of the hundred I'll even maybe consider. And I mean, how many times have I transferred something to you, Glenn? Almost never, never. do I say, hey, almost never because everybody does it wrong. Right. Everybody approaches me wrong. And I'm not going to tell you how to approach me because I don't want, um, I, 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 don't, I don't want a, a, a thousand inquiries. But um, it, it's all about how you approach the person. And so let me ask you a question. Let me back up to a question I have that I think is really, really important. I don't think, I think you can teach people how to sell. You can teach them, you know, if they have the right, you know, inclination for sales and all that. But what I think is screwed up sales for so many, so many times, and you kind of uh, alluded to it before when you said the, the person in charge of the sales department needs to see at the table. I think the management of salespeople have, has been horrendous. Right. And somebody that works with you or for you just commented on your style and they loved your style and they want to work for you and they love working for you because you're inclusive and all that. What happens when you have somebody that continually misses a, uh, a quarter, but they are doing all the right things. You see they're doing all the right things. They want it, but it's just bad you know, just, just a bad quarter for some reason, you know, all of a sudden the company went out of business or the person got fired that they were working with and they had like just quarter after quarter after quarter and their confidence is low and they're waiting for you to fire them. How do you bring that person back to life? Good question. Yeah. yeah. And I did not pay Roxanne. So Roxanne, thank you for that sweet comment. I just read it when you brought it up on the screen. So if you have the right person, you have to look at a couple things. If we have if we have an area sales manager that's underperforming, we need to look at why. How are they being led? How are they being coached? Where are they looking for business? Are they just looking for business in the wrong? There's multiple things when you have a checklist and you have some checks and balances. You jump into Salesforce and say, are they managing their accounts properly? Are they managing their pipeline? We have an incredible senior director of sales on our team um, who's been with us a long time, Amy Gerdot. And part of our inclusive culture, if there's an ASM struggling, we walk through, you know, we'll join them on a call. And is it, um, are, they, are they as prepared as they should be? And we hire senior people. So we're not hiring junior people, but we're trying to troubleshoot. So is it their call preparation? 
Is it um, they're just not fishing where the fish are? They're not looking in the right areas for sales? Right. Are they not managing their, pri their pipeline accordingly? What part of the sales process are they getting stuck? Is it closing? You can have a huge close one pipeline and not one room night attached to that account because getting preferred in a program does not mean they're going to stay with right. you. What are you doing to activate that account? So you have to kind of look at where are they getting stuck in that sales process and then help them and coach them through it. And then week over week on your one-on-one, -on -one, you're going to see the areas of improvement. And if, and if you're still stuck, you have to say, do we have the right person in the right seat? Right, and that's where attitude comes in play because if they're still stuck and their attitude is still positive and their attitude is still like, hey, doing everything you're telling me to, maybe it's a, t it's a tough territory, whatever it is, but the attitude is everything. I mean, wouldn't you say that in sales, that attitude is, you know, I, I've been around people that I literally, like people look at me and go, do you ever have a bad day? And, you know, I have bad days, but I never had a bad day. That's how I look at life, right? I've never had a bad day. But I look at people, I'm like, did you, like, you know what just happened to you? You just, like, your whole life just got messed up and you're still in a good mood. It's like, it's like, hey, man, I'm blessed, I'm grateful, right? And, and, and so those are the people I just can't get enough of because I just want to know what the hell you're doing to keep yourself so focused and so positive. And I, so to me, a positive attitude is everything. And look, sales is a grind. And over this past year, I can tell you our culture has only gotten stronger because we check in with our sales teams a lot because, the, you know, our industry was devastated. The clients we support are looking to us to help find business immediately. And so we check in on them a lot because they're feeling the pain. They feel the enormous responsibility and trust that our clients are giving us. And there's days that they're going to feel like I heard 20 no's today, but we've got an amazing team. They've got a pair partner that they get to um, everyone on our team. There's a pair partner. It's a buddy system. And a lot of it is just kind of banter back and forth and support and brainstorming. And then they've got a director of sales. When I have a few minutes in between calls, I every week take, uh, you know, three to five of our area sales managers. We've got teams and I just randomly call people. And at first I would randomly call them. It would be, holy crap, what did I do? Why is she calling right. me? And now it's like, how are the kids? How, how are your hotels behaving, right? Do you need my, we're here to remove barriers. And right. so they can get shit done, yeah, right? I, I love that. We are not here from an authoritarian position. You report to us. We are there to remove friction, and points of friction. And that's what good sales leaders do. And I don't think enough sales leaders and GMs do that. We add friction and we don't give them the support they need. Oh, I got to ask you this. Put a pin in that. Hold on a second. I'm sorry, Glenn. That is so critically important. Forget about sales. Forget about the hotel business. You just said that you gave the keys to the kingdom, right? Your job as a leader, your job as an owner of a company is to get shit done. How do you get shit done? You have to have a PhD in getting shit done. I always say yes. I have a PhD in getting shit. How do you do that? My only job is to remove your barriers. And you just really said everything that I truly believe in in one sentence. My only existence is to remove barriers. And if you ask me what's my favorite thing to do, my favorite thing to do is remove barriers. Because once I remove barriers, no one has an excuse. And I feel like I've just I, I add value to my team because a lot of times it's like, what does he do? It's right. like, like he's, he talks a lot and he runs around the world, but what does he really do? And when people see me in action, like, Oh man, this guy gets stuff done. There's nothing better than when a team sees you removing barriers. And I think I just want to put a pin in that because I think that is critical to, and that's where I think people uh, fall victim to right. their title, to their salary, to their incentives, to their money. And instead of saying, dude, the only reason you exist is to make that salesperson's job easier. I'm sorry, Glenn. I didn't mean to oh, that's all good. I will see your pin and raise you one more <laughs> pin. Tammy, when I was a young man, I used to hear this from women all the time. Glenn, it's not you. It's me. <laughs> Why aren't- I don't believe it. Whatever. Why are executives- in hospitality don't have that same attitude. Why is it always the salesperson's fault? And I'm, I'm exaggerating by saying always, but why is it frequently the salesperson's fault? 
Why aren't the managers taking more accountability on their role in their failures? And how could you encourage people to take a look internally and reevaluate how they're connecting with their sales team to make sure that they're on your side of things and calling people in the good times and not just being a jerk? I think it speaks volumes about an organization's culture. Mm -hmm. and, and not just at an individual hotel level, but whether you're a brand or a management company. And so the last chapter of the book is everybody, everyone is in sales, or at least they should be. So if you have a GM or an owner, or even at a regional or at a, at a national level, if you truly build a culture of sales and service, then you're not putting the entire onus on that one full-time seller right. who has sales in their job. The front desk, and we haven't talked about this, they are an incredible lead catching um, department. Right. But how many of those front desk folks see themselves as checking people in, checking people out? Housekeeping, maintenance, your food and beverage outlets, everybody's in sales. And so if you develop a culture with standard operating procedures, not just around how to check people in or out, but here are the, the moments of delight. Here are... Um, the moments of interaction where you can recommend, do you have dinner reservations tonight? When are you coming back? Hey, by the way, you booked on Expedia for three nights. You and a couple of your, you know, looks like you're here in town for a project. What company are you with? When an owner knows enough to be dangerous, they're not afraid of sales. Right. When you don't know enough to be dangerous, you fear it. You don't trust it. You right. become suspicious. And then you put sales in a corner, like you put baby in the corner, and you wonder why it's not thriving. You know, it's it's so important to make sure people know what a salesperson goes through. Um, go on the road if you're a general manager or a regional manager. Go on the road 100%. with salesperson. It is so critical. You know, when when I was first starting in television, um, I never understood, and I'm not an actor, but I don't understand how an actor or a host could be temperamental. I never understood it. And I was like, man, everybody's working together. Why is that person such an asshole? And I realized something because I became that asshole for a second is when you're doing your job, when you're trying to sell someone something, there's sometimes a second or a cup of coffee or a dinner that is critical to six hours worth of work or six months worth of work, that if you get in a salesperson's way, they're going to lose that. So they're a little bit different. Salespeople are a little bit different than an operations person because you don't see that six months worth of work. You see a housekeeper's cleaning room. You see a front desk person checking somebody in, but you don't see that last second they're putting it together where that VIP that's going on a site inspection wasn't taken care of and you see the salesperson spin. I understood that when I'm like all of a sudden about to say something to the camera and all of a sudden somebody says, oh, we have to change the light. That moment, I just spent six months trying to prepare myself for this moment. And then all of a sudden you're changing a light at the wrong time. So I become temperamental. So salespeople are temperamental. Well, they're temperamental because you screwed up their VIP that was supposed to get the room on the corner overlooking the bridge. And she, he's bringing his wife in this weekend and he has responsibility for $5 million worth of business for next week. And you don't understand that. Right. And it took two years to get to land the account. Right. That's the thing. Right. It could take two years to land that account and it's gone with one bad experience. And I don't know what it is. Maybe it's my Air Force training, but I was very fortunate to understand not in the beginning, very beginning, but pretty quickly sales and revenue management that we are just supporting cast to revenue management and sales. We are just supporting cast. You guys are the star of the show and we're just here pulling wires and hanging lights. And <laughs> until you get that, you don't understand the value right. of, of, of sales. And I'm going to read the last chapter of your book if I can. And I'll say before you do that, and that's why Christian Bell was right on the set of Terminator when he yelled at those people on uh, – on set. Oh, dude, that was insane. You know, Tammy, you know what he's talking about? It's Christian Bale. He can do what he... No, I don't, but I love oh, Christian Bale. He lost his complete... And I love him. Crap. There's one time, if they have it on... They don't have it on video, but if they have it on video, there's one time, at the, and I'm not proud of it, where I lost my crap big time. It was, I was at the Raceway in 
a homestead, homestead raceway. And I was outside and my producer made a mistake, but it, it was a mistake that really threw me off my game. And she didn't understand that was that big of a deal. Right. And I lost my shit. And it's the first time I really, really in my whole career that I felt that I was out of control because I've never been out of control. I don't throw things. I don't curse people. I didn't do any of that. But it was like, whoa, that was just a lot for anybody to have to handle. And so if my producer's listening, I apologize. And I don't blame you for not inviting me to your wedding. Um, the, the, so, so, but Christian Bale was in the middle of a scene. I was actually on, when I did my movie, James Kahn is in, is on set and there's a script writer or a script producer that's on a ladder right behind me. And uh, James Kahn and Alyssa Milano is in the scene. And uh, uh, James Kahn has to, it's like a 30 second pause in his mind, but in the script, it's probably like a few seconds, but he's pausing because he's about to say something, and he, but he doesn't say it at the end. So it's a lot of emotion. So you as an audience member know what he's about to say. And when he doesn't say it, you understand what he's about to say. Cause he didn't say it. You understand? It was like, like he was about to say he loved, he loved this, loved this person. But at the end, he knew he couldn't say it. So he didn't say it. So it was 30 seconds. And we're all sitting there watching. I'm like, this is amazing. And all of a sudden, the script person throws out the line, whatever the line was, the last line. Oh, my God. James Kahn, who is magnificent to work with, lost his shit. It made me literally shake. We sat there for 30 minutes because he left. Wow. He said, not one person for 30 minutes said a word. Not a word. We didn't move. I was a producer. I'm sitting there like this. He comes in, nails the line, and leaves, and then goes out and tells us a Godfather joke. It was the funniest thing in the world. So my point being is, whether it's a salesperson or whether it's James Conn, if you don't know the person's job, you don't know how to act, and that person apparently didn't know how to act around a a legend. And so- same thing with the salesperson. If you come into my office, I'm your manager. And there's another story, and I don't want to keep telling stories, but there's a story where a salesperson who's now a legendary salesperson in the industry came to me on a Sunday, called me and said, hey, I know the owners want to take this business. I said, meet me at the Intercontinental on 47th Street in Times Square Sunday. We had a drink. I said, we're going to take it. He goes, but the owner doesn't want it. We're taking it. It was Sunday business in August, and it turned out to be the um, amazing race. The production oh, for Amazing okay. Race to be in our hotel for five weeks. And our, and because the rate was a little bit lower, the owner didn't want to take it. I made a, an executive decision because the director of sales trusted me. And we beat the competition for those five weeks. Right. Every person in Times Square. That's awesome. Yeah. So let me read your last chapter. Your last. Yes. Oh. We're going to have to wrap up. So let's do this last chapter. I'm sorry. Don't apologize. Don't tell us <laughs> I thought that was my. I thought that I'm, was my I'm sorry. Job. I talk. I'm, I'm trying. I'm, I don't mean to talk so much. The hospitality industry is fiercely competitive. It's hard work, and it's not for the faint of heart. Amen. But it is also made up of some of the most passionate, dedicated, and resilient people I have ever met. Amen. Twice. Remember that sales is a marathon, not a sprint. The gains are usually rewarding for those who are willing to put in the work. Let's get selling. I yeah, love it. Yeah. Thank you, guys. This was wait, so much fun. Before we wrap up, Tammy, I just want to – that was just more of a statement to moving towards wrapping up, not officially wrapping up. Now, the last question I have for you is what is the message that is the most salient that you want people to walk away with from this last hour? What is most crucial? Why do they need to get room to grow? How is it going to improve their, uh, their careers? So sales is an imperative. It's not optional. And I think when times are good, it's not inspected, it's not supported, it's not even invested in. And so now there's a lot of interest. We've got clients, you know, of course, interested in our in our sales program. Um, but it's not a stop and start approach. The clients who have outperformed are the ones that have kept sales throughout the pandemic. They're going to ramp up faster. And that sales is three to six months. It's right. not hire somebody today and people are checking in next week. It's a medium to long-term gain. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to front the expense where hotels that have been without sales the last 16 months, 
you better get at it because your competition is going to eat your lunch and they're going to ramp up faster because there's not enough demand. Right. And if you're going to support them and bring them on site, set them up for success. And, and with this book, you will learn enough to be dangerous. To right. be able to do that. And what's good about the book is it literally you can read it in an afternoon. It's not a textbook. It's it's a very easy read. I read seven pages. I want to read the whole book, and I'll probably read it Thank by the you. end of the day. Lots of tactics, day. lots of juicy, actionable tactics for for anybody in the yes. anybody in the industry. And I'm gonna go pick up. Uh, I'm gonna go pick up a copy of my book, which is at the Canadian U.S. border right now. Yeah, so, please. Uh, I'll meet you there. The yeah. border's <laughs> open, but while well, the border, <laughs> April 9th, guys, will be open. Right? You saw that announcement yesterday. Really great news. Yep. I can't wait. I can't wait to come up there. Now, before we wrap up. Anthony, Tommy, you were doing doing something a little some some as well together. Is that true? Um, should we should we tease the audience a little bit? I'll let you, Anthony, tell uh, as much. One of the things that is necessary in this industry, and I'll, I'll say it this way, and you may agree or disagree with me, um, is storytelling, and is having masters tell stories. Master class, right? You've, we've all seen the master class. You know, my favorite one uh, I took was Daniel Negreanu, all about poker, and I learned a lot. And so that master class here, as you see, we need something like that in the hospitality business. So Tammy had this great idea of developing this master class of talking to the best in the in the business, and she asked me to come on and kind of help her kind of work on this. And then I'll yeah. bring my resources, whether it be Glenn or Suzanne or all the other people I work with, to kind of really help get the right class with the right person. I don't want to say master, but the right person to really talk. And to me, it's not just a classroom. It's a conversation. Right. It, it's telling stories. I find that I get the most reaction. And when people hear one of my stories, because in that story, and even what Suzanne started doing, our producer, when she was at Boston University or Boston College, right. she started taking one of my episodes of Hotel Impossible and breaking it down because Hotel Impossible was, it's a story. And she broke it down into a classroom. And, and really, be, be, and so that's kind of where I get my most reactions when I tell a story. So I really think that this series that Tammy and I are working on is really telling great stories to really teach people how wonderful this business is. Yes. And, but giving them takeaways, not just stories, but also uh, um, takeaways. Tammy, you want to kind of. Uh, yeah, up? we need to elevate the training in this industry, not just in sales. And, and this is going to be high quality production. Uh, videos. It's not death by PowerPoint. We're all zoomed in. We're all zoomed out. Um, it's going to be high level on demand at your disposal. Education meets inspiration so we can elevate our industry collectively and, and make hospitality cool again, the way it was when I started 30 years ago. There's a lot of work to be done, but I'm more inspired and more committed than ever before to be able to help in the recovery of, of our industry. I mean, we just got the tagline for, for the classes. What is it? Education yeah. and inspiration. Education meets inspiration. Write Why that am down. I being a marketing company? I guess a million dollars. No, I'm okay. serious. Write that down. Because you know what? I've never really been able to, to quantify what me and Glenn do. But one of the reasons this show has been successful is not only because Glenn's a reporter and Glenn's a writer and Glenn's all that, and, and I'm a hotel guy, and Glenn, a hotel so guy. Well, is we make it fun and we tell stories and we go off on tangents, but we also get to the important okay. stuff. you know. And I know when I'm talking too much like I did today and I shut up and I let Glenn go for 10 minutes. And, and that's when we get yeah. the important stuff. But then we get the good stories as well. And I think that that's why this Great show stories. is – Like yesterday, our, the, the gentleman that was on yesterday that's running a HOA – his compliment to us was my one of my favorite compliments because it came from a guy that's done every single thing in this business and he meant it from his soul. You can hear it. He's like, what you guys are doing for this industry is critical because he knows it's entertaining and it's educational. And, you know, it just that's what we need to be doing. More to come on that. And we'll be at Alice next week. We'll be at Ahoa the first week of, of uh, August. So stop by and say hello. And I will say... Um, 
that something we have one of the people that's going to do one of our classes is a quadruple superstar. Ooh. We're shooting, we're shooting the first master class in don't, Miami. You can't say who. You can't say. No, no, I will no, not. That's don't your say else. Don't say anything else. Very soon, coming soon, we'll be drip feeding you on this show. But lots of good stuff to come. I will, I will tell you. I will tell you. Um, it's just a, a superstar of our industry. Wow. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to find out. Let's say it now. It's Glenn Houseman. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll be, uh, I will be uh, doing a master class in how to survive not one but two sets of a uh, of a fish show. So that should be really, that should be really good. So, <laughs> so far that. It's all about maintaining for three, four hours in a row. All right, Tammy, be sure to. Uh, I love this book. I can't wait till I get my copy. I know it's a uh, was Stuck holding in the border. Before. I'll get it later today. I'm going to read every single page. But if it doesn't come today, I'm going to Amazon.com. I don't know you folks up in Canada go to Amazon.ca. Or if you like Barnes & Noble, I hear they still exist. And you can get the book over there as well. So make sure you check out GillisSales.com and the book Room to Grow. Thank you so much for being here, Tammy. We really appreciate you. Thank you both. Had a lot of fun. See you soon. See you soon. Bye-bye. See you guys. Bye. Thank you. What a great cover. I love the cover too. Yeah, it's really good. They did a great job at the publishing company on that. Man, that was a whole lot of fun today. And you know, as somebody who's scared of doing sales, or at least I used to be scared of doing sales, it's nice to know that we're not alone in in this. I that do, I, I, do things. I, first of all, uh, I want to say thank you to Ken Green for that compliment. Uh, yep. His name his, his name escaped me for a second. Um, but I hate sales. I can't hate it more. I because I hate being controlled and I don't like being controlled by goals mm -hmm. or incentives. Yep. It's like, it's, it's everything I'm against in my, in my life. I perform, I, I get paid. And so, but I have such an appreciation for sales and respect. And again, pushing things out of their way so they can be successful. Yep. I love salespeople. I love being around salespeople. I just cannot sell. And uh, as as proven that you and I both suck at selling advertising, and we're just fortunate that advertising comes to us because we do nothing to sell. You hate salespeople? No, I love salespeople. I hate selling. Uh, Give it yeah. right. <laughs> uh, that, is, that is absolutely right. Uh, it's like the good folks over at uh, Ecotech, by the way, ecotechwaste.com. But also, hey, if any of you all out there want to do some sales for us, drop me a line. Glenn at NoVacancyNews.com. Glenn with two ends at NoVacancyNews.com. Now, also, big issue, it's summer. You guys are all outside. You're doing fun stuff. Sometimes you're not behind your desk. You want to take us on the go. Be sure to do that with the audio version of the podcast. That's why, you know, a lot of people are doing that. That's why both No Vacancy Live and the Checking In with Anthony and Glenn are in the top one half of 1% of all podcasts globally. Just imagine if they were on one feed. Check it out at Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, all of the places that you like to get your shows. Yeah, it's on Google. Yeah, it's on Stitcher, wherever you want. If you want to reach out to Anthony, you find him at Anthony Hotels. And I, of course, am at Traveling Glenn. And Ooh. as a friend said to me the other day, but Anthony, you don't get a lot of views on Facebook during your live show. It's like, no, because most people listen to us on their podcast oh. and we have live feeds on like 17 different platforms. So you incorporate all that and you know what you get? You get a badass show. Hey, baby. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for being here and be like us. Remember, because you've got one life, so blaze on and. All right, let's let's uh, reference uh, "Be Like Mike." What was that like? Uh, that was uh, not not "Be Like Mike." The, what, I, oh, I just screwed oh. up the cereal commercial. The, be like, the, oh, Mikey likes it. Mikey likes it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know when you said that. He just likes then. it. Mikey, Mikey likes it. it. <laughs> he really likes it. Wheaties. That's right. Mikey All likes right. it. All right, everybody. Let's uh, let's go grab some uh, some cereal. How's that? Be kind to yourself. See y'all later. Room to grow.